Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Sample, Professor of Responsible Research Innovation at Leibniz University, Hanover. Um, welcome to our the final event in our speaker series. I'd like to also introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn, at the Faculty for Humanities, who's provided theme for the series, and um, she will also be the moderator for discussion and Q&A. So if during the event, if there's any questions you want to pose to the panelists, please send those via chat to Anna. It's um, We'll, she'll collect them and then call on you when it's when it's time. Today we have, um, unfortunately, our live captioner couldn't make it. We have a digital solution. It's imperfect, but you can access it by clicking on the little live button at the upper left corner uh, and then open streaming. It'll open a browser window with the live transcript. Even though it says it's a live stream, don't worry, it won't record your video or anything like this. So um, just a few words about the motivation for the series. You're joining us for, as I said, the final talk um, in a multi-event series. If you've made it through all the events, thank you. And I hope it's been interesting. Uh, the motivation really is to take imagination seriously. And this isn't merely in the sense of uh, fantasy or sort of free thinking, but imagination in the sense that important values and institutions are open-ended and perspectival. So the imagination is not merely a method for sort of um, creating new ideas, but actually re rethinking what we want out of important institutions and societal values. So in the, in the context of this series, we're asking how can narrative and fiction and poetry and alternative, so alternatives to the scientific method be used to reimagine and reform science despite its ongoing connections to power and oppression. So we've had some really great insights over the series, just to give you um, the thousand foot view. We had Leah Ceccarelli talking about rhetoric and she argued overall that our expectations for science are linked to how we represent science in the media. And sh she suggested that we need new understandings of scientists as citizens in democracy. Then we had novelists, Asako Serizawa and Wakey Wong. They highlighted two really powerful ways to write about science as it actually exists. So respectively, that was talking about science as an ally of imperial violence, subject to uh, imperfect histories and silences, uh, and then also science as a frustrating career, as a source of, uh, as a dead end. And these are the things I think that maybe get missed in many academic discussions of the scientific method or capital S science. In December, we had two scholars of literature, Tita Chico and Travis Lau, who reflected on the gap between science and literary theory, showing that it wasn't nearly as wide as the two cultures debate would suggest. Science, um, as I hope is all of you wouldn't know by now from the series, has its own literary tropes, its own forms of narrative and writing. And so it's as amenable to these conversation as anything else. So today we're really happy to, to close out the series with two um, amazing poets and thinkers First, we have uh, Joey Kim, a scholar, creative writer, and assistant professor of English at the University of Toledo. She researches global Anglophone literature with a focus on 18th and 19th century. Her first book of poems, Body Facts, was released by Diode Editions in 2021. A literary critic, as well as a poet, her forthcoming book, Romanticism and the poet Poetics of Orientation, highlights the racial and ethnic formation of the poetic subject in terms of Orientalist forms of cultural differences. Kelly Stevens Kane is a poet, playwright, and oral historian, author of Hallelujah Science. She's a Cave Conum Fellow, August Wilson Center Fellow, and a recipient of Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation. She studied at Vona, Hurston Wright, and Callaloo. Her work has appeared lots of places, to name a few, uh, North American Review, uh, the Little Patuxent Review, Under a Warm Green Linden, Painted Bride Quarterly, African Voices, and Split This Rock. She's also read her poetry and oral history um, and performed her one-woman show, Big George, nationally. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us and sharing your amazing work. So let's um, start with you, Joey. Thank you so much, Matthew and Anna and Kelly. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Can everyone hear me? Okay, 
So the poems in this book, Cloudy Facts, they imagine conversations with my Korean elders and my ancestors through familial and national histories. They were written at different ages of my adult life, reflecting around 15 years of writing. Thus, they have um, 15 years of different voices and subjectivities. They also serve as an Anglophone channel through which to really interrogate the Trump administration's discourse of US and Korea relations from the perspective of a Korean American in the diaspora. And these poems at the same time are deeply intimate, confessional, expanding the limits of the white lyric subject to new subjectivities and borders. Um, through what I call my practice of citational and documentary poetics, Body Facts is the beginning of a longer series of works interweaving individual bodily experiences, traumas, memories, historical events, and Korean history and art forms such as verse. So there's one poem in here like that is a Korean shijo, which is a traditional three line verse form from the um, 13th century. Overall, I guess my creative philosophy is one of collective responsibility, historical recovery and individualized aesthetic experiences. I really think about art and poetry as founts of didactic, like learning didactic as well, methods through aesthetic frames. Um, recently, my colleague Tali Goff said, and it really spoke to me in terms of what I'm trying to do with my writing and all these registers, like I'm tired of the lengths we have to go in writing to prove something is missing from history when it was clearly violently erased. So missing is kind of too passive. I wanna think not lost histories, forgotten histories, but like denied histories. And my poems are one part of the larger project of active writing and speaking back to a long swath of silence and erasure, specifically in, these, in this collection for Koreans, both on the peninsula and then around the world. So um, I just, I'm going to read a few poems from the collection. The title, specifically Body Facts, comes from a pair of poems of the same title in the book, Body Facts 1 and 2. And these really interrogate the idea of the body as human, as land, I'm thinking peninsula, you know, nations, and then also body as an object possessed, dispossessed, plundered by war and colonialism. I would like to provide a content warning that these poems do reference difficult traumatic material, such as body image, disordered behaviors, identity-based discrimination and harassment. Um, and I do look forward to discussing my work alongside Kelly's um, after I read. So the first one, plunder. Plunder. Factually speaking, the Korean War is ongoing. And according to Dr. Millard, the celebrated American plastic surgeon who brought his double eyelid surgery to Korea, quote, the Asian monolid gives the effect of an expressionless eye sneaking a peep through a slit, end quote. Millard mused in his words, how to quote unquote, deorientalize the patient. Unable to find research in English, he devised his own method of raising the bridge of the nose to widen the space between our eyes. Quote, alas, folds that were exotic in Pusan or Kyoto will become strangely foreign to Main Street of a Midwest town or under the columns of a Southern mansion. End quote. Sung up her magic to plunder our body facts as end of war goodwill. Skin extracted as porcelain, chinju, the pearl of the Orient. Peregrinating in his quote unquote Asian wood, he moved skin and hair to new parts of our bodies. We were, quote, alas, folds that were exotic, end quote. Like this wrinkle, that is the slit through which sight is blunted. The man 
in the drive-through window at the local Dairy Queen, staring through my sisters and me. Body facts. One, I, quote, every night during my first week in the Orient, I dreamed of Z plasties on thousands of mongoloid folds. But by the time a month had passed, I seldom gave them another thought. In the Oriental eye, there is an excess of upper lid skin, and this is padded by a surplus of supraorbital fat. Due to the droop of the upper lid, only the lower half of the iris is exposed. This gives the effect of an expressionless eye sneaking a peep through a slit, a characteristic which through fact and fiction has been associated with mystery and intrigue, the organ of sight, end quote. Two, face. Quote, senses denoting a part of the body and related uses, the front part of the head, from the forehead to the chin, and containing the eyes, the nose and mouth, the countenance, the visage, the face associated with mystery and intrigue." End quote. Three, nose, a plastic jaw, flat-faced, buttoned, too wide, pointy, hook, aquiline, more skin for the taking. Four, Tongue, o juice, moist, slobbering for kogi meat. Five, hand. Her hand is too small to reach a full octave on the piano. Appas are bloated from stealing mountain garlic from the park. Six, stomach. My stomach skin is stretched and looks elephantine after all the weight loss of high school. Seven, throat. The throat connects the mouth and nose to my breathing passages. And I breathe in to hide truculent flesh. Eight, fingers. Down my throat touching skin abraded. Firm grip for provisions gathering voice to throw into vitrified relief, finger, wrist, tremor. Nine, arm, tingles, haven't gone away after the skateboarding accident and 10, head, aches, migraines, the skull crushed into 11, brain, Official diagnosis, quote, intraparenchymal hemorrhage of brain due to trauma, end quote. Seizures have stopped, but 12. Body, Terry's. This is the final poem I'll be reading. Body facts two. One, body a birth. Two, body a job. Three, body smells like too much garlic. Four, body gropes for another body. Five, body gut errand. Six, body susceptible to miasma. Seven, body, searches for muscle memory after trauma. Eight, body, part a digit four. Nine, body, count my body on the scale so that 10, body, can auger touch. The idea of contact between my 11, body, and another's, notwithstanding, prophylactic or PPE, be that as it may, 12, body, quote, associated with mystery and intrigue, 
end quote, becomes the Asian pear. I bring as a hostess gift to my white neighbor's barbecue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey, for your lovely reads. And I hope for attendees tonight or maybe afternoons on your end that you can kind of try to think about topics of the body, the nation, and the, in the politics, like Joey had said, mentioned, like the literal body and the manifestation of politics in, in, in the sense of geopolitical boundaries and borders. And so now we have Kelly, who'll read some excerpts from Hallelujah Science. And if I may, because I read both collections many times in preparation for tonight's event, um, I think there's a, another idealized idealization of the body. And so it'll be interesting to compare and contrast the two. So Kelly. Hi, thank you so much, Joey and Anna and uh, Matthew uh, for having me, for sharing this. We were talking right before we came on. It's just such a miracle to be here. We're alive <laughs> in this space. And I know there's a lot of Zoom fatigue that the, the and I was feeling that too. But this morning I thought, you know, it's really bizarre and wonderful that we can click something and we're not in the same space, but we are in the same space. So there's something exciting in that to rediscover that you can actually kind of do this thing that we would have never been able to dream of. <laughs> that we could, um, And in this pandemic time with Max, that we're actually in each other's faces and we can see each other's faces. So I want to appreciate that. Um, you know, just trying to see some of the bright side of such a time that we're in. Um, so um, my collection is Hallelujah Science and Joey, we were, we were twins on the <laughs> little tabs. I, saw. Um, I actually moved mine from the top. So I thought, well, I'll put them on the side. So um, this um, collection took 10 years to find the right publisher. So dozens of rejections. So um, especially in an academic setting, really in any setting, I like to share that because just the idea of persistence, um, you know, and you're not gonna be persistent every minute of the day. You know, there's times where you back away, but just the idea of continuing to pursue something, even if it seems elusive or it may never happen, um, I think is just, again, kind of a wonderful, thing that I hope I can kind of sprinkle if anyone needs that today. Um, so this collection, um, it's interesting to Joey, where you were talking about time. Um, most of these poems were written um, in the 1996, 98 timeframe. So it's kind of a time capsule in that sense for me, um, a time capsule of my imagination and subconscious, um, thinking about the body <laughs> a lot um, at that time. So, uh, you know, I feel like I was a whole other person at that point. Um, but at the same time, when I pick up the work, it still felt new and fresh in some kind of way. And then Anna asking um, me to participate in something to do with science, I thought, I like each reading I do to be an experiment for me to see, you know, what else can I find? What else can I bring? How can I make it exciting? And so the lens of science and kind of picking through the poems that you had already selected and thinking, why did you pick that? What can I think about it that's different? And so I also want to share that spirit, spirit of curiosity. I don't believe that there's a correct interpretation for these poems. So um, I'm gonna, I'm, I usually read and don't talk a lot and these poems are little. So this is the first time I'll be talking a lot and reading these tiny little chunks of things. So whatever I say, this is part of my experiment for today, my exploration for today, um, my curiosity recently preparing for this. And so don't take it as, you know, well, I've heard the author and she said, that's what this means. So now that we've established that. The titles in the collection are numerical and we may or may not talk about that later. 
Um, you can always um, reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, if you have questions about things later. So this one is titled Nine, and it's actually the first poem in the book. It's nighttime. When the sickness spreads out, when the cramps grip tighter, when the lost souls of earlier dead encircle me and blow ancient germs in my face. I am miserable, my feet are cold, and I want to be alone. That's what we wanted to chant the souls blowing in circles. So, in terms of this moment, in this kind of science in the body theme, I looked poem and I found the word germs, blowing ancient germs in my face. And I thought, well, what does that actually mean? And so I looked up the definition of germ. And what's cool is there are two different, well, there are probably more, but the two definitions that are very different excited me. So one is pathology, a microorganism, especially one that produces disease in animals or plants. And the other is biology, a simple structure such as a fertilized egg that's capable of developing into a complete organism. And so that kind of dual meaning really fits with the hallelujah science. There's kind of a, a worldly and otherworldly um, flickering back and forth, I think, in the title and in the, in the collection that's also in that word. And so the idea of blowing germs, we're in this pandemic, obviously, that is the first thing, at least for me, that I think of, but also the idea of blowing germs that could develop into new organisms is quite exciting. And it's actually one of the themes in the book because there's a lot about fertility. Uh, so let's explore another one. This is the second poem in the book. It's called 42. Welcome brain to the last moments before sleep. Drugged with fatigue, I slide my words up and down and my hot hands catch odd associations on paper. I'm losing contact with the little people, the ones who live in radios and sing. My face red with upstairs running. So when I thought about this poem, I thought about, in a way, I never noticed this before, but I think it's the Rx, like the prescription for the book itself. Um, the method that I was using this, I wasn't, I wouldn't even have really considered myself a writer when I started writing this. I was writing in the sense that I wrote uh, in a journal. Um, this was probably me in a bed half asleep literally exploring that half awake, half asleep time and what that, what I could access, what can you make from there? Um, and, you know, it, you're a little different and sometimes freer there. And so this poem maybe is the kind of formula that um, is part of the creation story of the book and having, again, that one foot in each world, the sleep world and the awake world. And so that's what I was thinking about that one. Do one or two more, depending on our time. Uh, the next one is the title poem from the book. It's called 35, but it has the words Hallelujah Science in it. Um, and that's how I named the book. I had written, you know, lots of poems and initially was going to call the book Fever Poems. And one of my teachers suggested that I could probably do better for a title um, and suggested that I go through and find something that maybe was already there. And so Hallelujah Science was embedded in this one and felt like it worked. 
course, everything revolves around me. The moon, the stars, the grocery clerks. Picture me higher than the clouds, orchestrating lightning flashes. Who here knows about science? Not talking about beakers and Bunsen burners. I'm talking about hallelujah science, seashell and fossil science, look out the window collision science. Too many people bother me. I ought to cook them in soup. So, when I think about soup, I thought about, again, just exploring and being curious about, you know, what's in this poem? Um, I thought about primordial soup. And again, um, the definition of primordial being existing at or from the beginning of time, primeval. So this is kind of like, Again, we're talking about creation and fertility and where things begin. Um, another definition um, of a cell part or tissue in the early stages of development. And then this idea, the, the first time I read this actually, I um, was doing stirring moment, motions the entire time. And that made me think about, you know, there's something about stirring soup, the, the circularity and the cyclical and the fact that, you know, the, the uh, there's a human reproductive cycle that, um, I don't know, it, it's part of this primordial soup. I don't even know if I'm making any sense, but it feels like there's something going on there that, I don't know, was exciting to me. And then I thought about, um, idea of you know there are physical sciences and earth sciences and life sciences and the the concept of there being hallelujah sciences um and what that could mean so i'll just leave that as a question i don't have an answer i kind of do but it's just a question i think it's more interesting than an answer I'll, what's our time frame do i have time for one more okay i'll do one more um, this one is called 16, and it's super short. I check my temperature every few minutes just to see how high I am, am I high how, I am how high, high how I am. So the, the funny thing about this, I, I can't get back in my head and see where I was with this, but I have one of two guesses. Definitely the experiments with sleep, um, you know, being half asleep and half awake in writing. There were other experiments with being uh, feverish. And just, again, you're kind of out of your head in a way and writing. So I can see me taking my temperature and seeing these numbers fluctuate. I can also, um, remember at this time, um, really being interested in the science of fertility, right? The science of our, our, of our bodies. So there's a, um, it's called basal body temperature charting. So the concept of basal is base, so baseline um, temperature at rest. Um, in the morning, taking a temperature and charting it. And the menstrual cycle is such that there will be, um, I mean, everyone's experience is different, everyone's body is different, but if you were to look this up, you would see this type of conversation where um, temperatures are lower in the beginning of the menstrual cycle. And then when progesterone gets to a certain point, the temperatures go up. And then if there's implantation of an egg, sometimes they go up another, to another level. So this way of starting the day with all of these, this temperature taking and this curiosity about, you know, 97.7, 97.8, 2 you know, just, <laughs> it's a, it's, it, it's interesting 
thing to learn about. Um, and that's something that I was doing. So it's perhaps the origin of that poem. And uh, I also thought it was interesting, like if you can see the poem in the book, the how high I am, how, how high I am, uh, is kind of a four by four grid of rearranging these um, words. And it kind of started looking almost like a, a, a permutations and a rearranging of code, um, again, to figure out how something is made. So um, I'll stop there um, with my current exploration of Hallelujah Science. <laughs> I'll take speaker share to quickly also acknowledge the students who are in attendance. Part of their final project was to um, for them to be in conversation with me, their, their instructor, to talk about how do you think about text as dialogic? So that wouldn't just mean reading text and then talking about it out loud. It's about how we, do we build the conversations beyond the text? So this is a practice for them to think about organizing, being inclusive, using references as a starting point for a bigger conversation. And with that, I wanted to remind attendees to please, if you have any questions, send them to me and um, we'll call on you. This is just to weed out the questions that might be a bit redundant. And because we only have about 26 minutes for discussion, we want this to be fruitful and robust as possible. And on that note, I want to begin the discussion maybe for you both, Joey and Kelly, to respond to each other. Um, so I'm very struck about this language of science, of course, because it's the one of the topics of the lecture series. So for Joey, you write about science in terms of nation states, um, geopolitics, and plastic surgery. So your, the three poems that you shared tonight had one reference in common, which was the, the citation of David Ralph Miller's essay so that's something that recurred through the three poems. And then Kelly, you noted that you use words and then you would do kind of extra research. So when you discuss each poem after you read them, you told us that the, the type of research and questions and curiosities that guided you into kind of crafting these, these very short poems that mean actually a lot more in terms of body pains and how do you understand your body through science. So could each of you tell us um, this use of language and science, did you, how much research did you have to do? Why did you want to include these references and in language of science? Um, sh those are great questions. And it was wonderful to hear um, your poems, Kelly, because I see a lot of overlap. I'm thinking like the ways in which we're thinking about like num numbers, like this phenomenology of perception, like, because I was thinking about like the ways in which the experience is also like this hallelujah science, this idea that like this intrinsic knowledge that's also about experience and the phenomenological things that we inhabit. And great questions, Anna, I guess, in terms of language and what made me want to cite Dr. Ralph Millard was this idea, like these poems are traveling through time, like the settings, they go from a yellow school bus in Ohio to, you know, the Japanese occupation in 1910. But with this one sense of like this Dr. Ralph Millard article. So he was a plastic surgeon and I'm citing um, this peer reviewed journal article in this plastic surgery journal for the US where he used he was actually a war physician who came to the peninsula during the Korean War, and he was actually tasked with um, helping Korean um, people due to like war injuries and violence on our bodies. But what he saw in Korean people was an opportunity to devise a new method of double eyelid surgery. And he's using in this article as this wonderful American plastic surgery invention um, we are kind of the bodies and the faces on which he is enacting this new American type of eyelid surgery. And I re really thought it was an interesting parallel, especially speaking as a Korean American in the diaspora, to think about the ideas of Korean and Korean peoples in our bodies as kind of a map for this American imperialist gaze. And it speaks to, I don't it speaks to this idea of world making and medicine and um, 
that I think that you were speaking to Kelly. If, I don't know if there's any connection to what you were thinking, but. Yeah, it's super, super interesting parallels. I'll be thinking about that, thinking about this for a while. Um, I also noticed the numerical um, play that, that we're both doing that hopefully we can talk about. Um, I'm jumping all over the place. Um, you mentioned, Anna, um, research. Um, at the time of writing, I think the research was just into my own imagination and subconscious, honestly. And then um, in preparation for this, I kind of came back to it from like, what do these words actually mean? What, what is a germ? What is, uh, you know, what, what was taking my temperature about actually? Um, the, the surprise for me was, you know, although it's called Hallelujah Science, I didn't sit down as a scientist to, you know, so um, having the opportunity to look at it that way um, and that there's lots of things in there was, it's, even though you're the author, you can still discover your own work, I guess, is, is um, something that's important to know. Um, I don't know. I'll leave it there. I think um, maybe I'll also take um, organizer's privilege to ask another question. Maybe this is uh, just a, 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 maybe a, a more petty way to ask Anna's more fundamental question. It's about academics. And um, so academics sort of have a habit of claiming science and medicine as their turf. And this often blurs into authority, even over the body. And this obviously has loads of problems. And this comes in sort of two flavors, right? Only um, credential scientists can do science. Only you know, only surgeons can do medicine. This type of thing. And then, of course, it comes. You can see it in the humanities too. I'm tra trained as a philosopher, so you can see philosophers of science saying, "Science is sort of our. It's our turf to define what science is. What good science is." Um, so I'm curious what you think about this, because really what um, your poems and discussion so far has suggested is that poetry has its own contribution to rethinking about rethinking science as an institution, as an idea, as a space of possibilities. Uh, I was really struck by um, Kelly, you bring a question. Can there be other sciences? Can you know what would if we added another science body of sciences, what would it be and how and how? And then Joey, you add that your body fact sort of reframes the medicalized body, not as something that facts come in to cure, but as a site of, of violence. So I think that these, you know, in many ways, this answers the same questions academics are trying to answer, but it doesn't really fit into the standard territorialization of the field. So I'm curious, um, how do you see yourselves as contributing to understanding science and medicine? Uh, are you comfortable with even phrasing it in that way? Mm. That's a great question. And I like what you're saying, the territorialization, right? Because it speaks to this idea of land and body and dispossession and like territories, colonialism, but it also speaks to like, you know, I'm a creative writer, but I'm also a literary critic. And it's like, there is like also within that space, like this radical disjuncture that I feel kind of I have to bridge because like these disciplined borders of things. And so much of, I think that what I can't speak for you, Kelly, but I see this over like, like undisciplining ourselves beyond the fixed rigid structures and registers and discourses and modes of writing that I think is something that is a sense of knowledge production, right? Like, like art and poetry and writing as, a, as didactic frames for understanding the body and finding medical and scientific knowledge beyond the borders of pre-existing traditions, I guess is something that um, through this idea of, I guess I didn't know when I was writing this that I was actively participating in this idea of like 
resisting science and medical knowledge. But now that I'm reading these poems now, I'm like, oh, it's all kind of there, right? So it also gives me a new appreciation for what I'm kind of mapping through this much more um, individualized sense of experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking, you know, it's important in science, you observe, you collect data, you want to be able to reproduce results and that makes it true, you know? And if there's such a thing as a hallelujah science, it would be, and if you've thought of something else, please keep it, don't let me replace your own innate, you know, impressions of the book. But I'm thinking it's the science of spark of creation, right? So there's, you know, like I'm talking about this temperature taking and um, there's definitely science going on in fertility. However, that whatever makes it actually happen, we can't necessarily control, we can try to control it, but we really don't know. How, I mean, we can try to um, control something, but we, we, we just can't. We don't know what that is. And so I'm kind of, I think I'm getting at what, what is that spark? What, what is, what is that spark? Um, and I was also thinking about, you know, in terms of the writer in, and the kind of the influence in what we're trying to do with this. And Joey, when I was listening to your work, I, I had recently given an interview and, and the question was, what do you see the current role of the writer being in the larger culture? Do we even have one? What do you think the role of a writer should be? And I said, we give frame of reference transplants, a way to escape yourself and return to experience an expanded version that has more imagination and empathy. And so in that sense of medicine, I think that's often a missing piece, not understanding, um, not having a wide enough frame of reference um, for our bodies and our experience in the bodies and the culture around that. Um, so I hope as writers, we can have an influence there. So I have a question from one of my students, Tina. Both of you write about science in both factual and also in how Kelly put it in primordial ways. So her question is, how do you see science as something that is basically human and inherent to all of us rather than a discipline that can only be truly practiced in a lab or similar serious institution? You, I mean, how, I guess, another way to think about this question in terms of the ongoing conversation is, if there has been distinct paradigms or binaries or dichotomies in which we separate science and literature, what really would be the symmetrical point? So it's not us using the word science in our writing practices, but, but how would we reach this kind of perspectival, to use Joey's word, um, narratives for science to actually listen to these kind of different narratives? So that's my add on to Tina's question. Mm. <laughs> that's tough. I, I was gonna just jump in and to start the conversation because I'm not quite sure of the answer, but I think it's really important to remember that science is everywhere. So, right, we silo things and put them in buckets, but um, I don't know if any of you have seen this I think it's still on Netflix. Um, it's, a, it's a series called The Code by Marcus S-A-U-T-O-Y. And he's done this thing where he's looking everywhere and seeing the patterns in nature, the mathematics, the um, math and science are literally everywhere. And you can't, you can't undo that. And so I think just to start the conversation, if, if we get too specialized in thinking that only certain people can do things or only certain people can have discussions, 
um, we're already disconnecting from something that's bigger. Mm. I like that kind of like science is everywhere and who here knows about science? I'm really thinking about like, well, science in many ways is just a fancy word for recorded experience and observation. Science, the root word is also, it's a body of knowledge. So it's like, who is to say that body of knowledge is different than that body of knowledge? It's like knowing. So um, yeah, definitely like a fancy word for just literally experience that has been observed and systematized. Like, oh, hypothesis, we're gonna test it out. And then also just literally to know, to know something, right? So I'm trying to connect it to what Traver, Travis Law was saying in the last um, presentation. He, as some of you might know, he's also a poet and he releases a daily poetry collection called Pairing. And I had asked him about what counts as work in the academy. And even though he's in an English department, they still kind of have, or at least I think my understanding of his answers, like they have scientific values in which they use to, to make what types of work count and legible to the academy. And, and, I, and I'm trying to contrast this with um, Dr. Anthony Christian O'Connell's piece for the catapult. It was called Why PhDs Need to Study Creative Writing. Um, I'll give you a link because it's quite interesting because he's trained as a, so or they're trained as a sociologist. And there, are some, there was some good advice, but also it, it continued to re reify these boundaries on what counts in academic writing and then what is the other type of writing. And while I think the intentions were good, I think that we need to maybe think more of not really to make these continual distinctions, but how can we kind of make narratives more holistic and inclusive and that in turn has to make scientists be aware that their scientific narrative should not be the conclusion to the ways that we understand the world and the, the ideas of poetry and language and prose, like they all go together. Um, so I didn't have a question. I was just, these are things that I'm thinking aloud as we're yeah. talking about the poetics and prose, science. You're making me think about um, something I read in the last, maybe it was a couple of years ago that medical, medical schools were actually recruiting from the humanities and actually creative writing, you know, you wouldn't think that you would go into fiction to become a doctor, but the idea was that the students that had studied literature were better able to really assess the patient's story, right? So if you're diagnosing, um, you know, if you just wanna look at the back of my throat and, you know, the thing on my toe, that's one thing, but if you're understanding, you know, the living situation and really getting to know the person and the story and the history that you're going to have a much better chance of really helping that that patient so again that concept of um things being not in different buckets <laughs> you know you were talking about the humanities and the sciences not uh, being uh, as separate back in the day you know as they are now so there's some recognition, I think, of, of that fact and some attempt to rectify, at least in some medical schools. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And this idea that we're all in all the fields we're doing, like narrative is a type of knowing, right? And doctoral students across our medical students being able to narrativize and imagine is a type of knowledge production that we cannot displaced from these citational metrics or these structures of academia and knowledge production and scholarly overviews and cite, citing and references and what is the tradition because that narrative thread is just the intrinsic sense of knowledge production that all of these fields will sustain themselves by, right? That's why I think we're seeing like medical humanities, health humanities, and in many ways, the creative writing I do isn't recognized by my job or the academy in the same way because I've been hired as a literary critic and I'm colleagues and friends with Travis. So it's like, 
the way in which my dossier for being a literary critic is much more differently judged versus my creative writing production, which is a separate category and that kind of bridge is something that isn't naturally to me, natural for me, but it's the way in which academia kind of structures my production. I'm really enjoying this discussion so far. I think it's really, um, we're in a strange cultural moment where you have, um, you know, to be published in the Guardian or, or sort of, if you want a column in, in like the front page of one of these big outlets, you often have to like invoke a little bit of science. You have to start with some sort of, Anna knows this better than I do, but no matter what you're writing about, you have to sprinkle in a little bit of, you know, this molecule has, you know, three carbon atoms, or it was first discovered in 1892, but whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have that, but at the same time, you also have, you know, um, these calls to say scientists should, PhD students should also learn creative writing, this other thing. You don't hear people saying science should become more inclusive or more holistic in the sense of like, scientists shouldn't include creative writing in their scientific publications. They should just study this other thing. So it's still maintaining the the binaries. So I, I'm what I'm hearing in this discussion is there's still a lot of room for sort of, as you said, um, Joey, undisciplining, sort of un, unlearning these boundaries and then rethinking what we can do together under the banner of science. And that, I think that's, it means something more than just putting a scientific fact into a creative essay and having a biologist write something creatively just as, a, as an aside. These are, I mean, those are great, but they're sort of different, different things. So maybe just, we only have five minutes left. I wanted to ask each of you not to put the burden of fixing science and society on each of you, but what's next for you? Um, any uh, works coming out, plans, hopes um, related to either this project or something totally new? I am working on, it's funny, um, oral an oral history project. I won't get into so much of the specifics, but in terms of this discussion, it's documentation, right? So it's listening, observing, documenting. Um, and I had never thought of that as a, you know, kind of sister to science <laughs> in that sense. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working with other people's words and shaping them into something that hopefully will be um, of interest. So I'll leave it there. That's awesome, oral history. That sounds really cool. Um, yeah, I'm working on more poems. I'm doing more work, expanding this into a longer collection. I'm looking into more translation work with Korean forms. And I'm really excited to um, just, because this was a shorter collection, to complete the collection with the longer full length in the coming. We'll see when it happens. Um, yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, thanks so much to, to both of you. And I, I'd like to thank the audience for participating and please all of us join uh, or thank Kelly and Joey for their amazing readings and thoughts.